Welcome to From AMIA to Armistice, a series of podcasts commissioned by UCL Institute of Education. I'm Simon Bendry, Director of the UCL Institute of Education's First World War Centenary Battlefield Tours Programme. In August 2018, students from across the United Kingdom joined students from France, the United States, Canada and Australia on the Western Front to commemorate the Battle of Amiens. This series, recorded largely on location during that battlefield tour, tells the story of the Battle of Amiens in the wider context of the First World War and the road to armistice. In this podcast, we join Professor Sir Hugh Strawn for the second of his morning briefings, when he considers the evolution of the war in 1918 and why the Battle of Amiens in the August was such a success for the Allied forces. What I want to do is talk about alliances, geography, and what that means for strategy. So in terms of alliances, yesterday we were thinking about 1916, today we're thinking about 1918. And in the interval, two world-changing events have taken place. There's been a revolution in Russia, the United States has entered the war and become a global player for the first time in the 20th century. That fundamentally changes this war. So first of all, the implications of the Russian Revolution. First Russian Revolution in our calendar in March 1917, there is some hope in the Allied camp that what that will mean is a renewal of Russian activity, that a liberal Russia will be able to tap into all those resources it has and be a more effective participant on the battlefield. That isn't what happens. In November 1917, the Bolsheviks seized power and commit themselves to taking Russia out of the war. This fundamentally changes the strategic equation. The central powers, they've got a front to the west here in France, a front to the east in Russia, and a front to the south. There is no longer an active eastern front. It seems at the time that this is a major central powers victory. They have already been dominating Russia. Now, under the terms of the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, they get, effectively, all European Russia. It gives up a third of its territory. Ukraine goes to Germany. By July 1917, the Central Powers will run from literally the doorstep here to Ukraine and from the Baltic states to the Balkans. This is just about as big as Hitler's Germany. But within this, for the Central Powers Alliance, there is the beginning of its unravelling. The Central Powers are made up of four states, Germany, Austria, Hungary, Bulgaria, and the Ottoman Empire. Each of the other three, apart from Germany, has an interest primarily in the East. With Russia out of the war, and with their gains in the East met, they have no further interest in this war. So from 1917 onwards, you have the Turks, the Austrians, and the Bulgarians all thinking, why should we fight Germany's war? The Austrians call the Germans the secret enemy, and the Germans call the Austrians the secret enemy. By 1918, Germans will be firing on Turks, and Turks will be firing on Germans. This alliance is unraveling. On the other side of the equation, the United States enters the war in April 1917, almost immediately after the Russian Revolution. The United States enters the war principally thanks to the extreme provocation of Germany, a combination of unrestricted U-boat warfare and a direct threat to the territorial integrity of the United States because Germany approaches Mexico for a deal in the event of hostilities between Germany and the United States. That combination brings the United States into the war. In many ways, the arrival of the American Expeditionary Force in France is the least important by August 1918 in terms of what the United States contributes. The United States contributes, number one, money. The Allies have been borrowing in the United States to fund this war ever since the war's beginning. And now that borrowing is effectively unlimited because they can rely on Wall Street to help keep the war going. Number two, the United States is shipping goods to the Allies across the Atlantic, which is precisely why the Germans thought it was worth the risk of fighting the United States in the first place. Number three, the impact of the United States militarily comes first of all at sea. They can provide 
escorts for convoys, which they do within a month of entering the war, and they make the blockade, the economic war waged against Germany, tighter than ever before. The United States, until April 1917, is the largest neutral country in the world, and it is the world's leading industrial power in 1917. When it becomes a belligerent, the neutrals in Europe, which so far have been importing goods in order to transship them to Germany and make massive profits, are now being squeezed by the United States itself. So Germany is running short of goods and food in 1917-18 in a way it has not done before. Then, of course, there is the American Expeditionary Force. The United States Army in April 1917 is tiny. There is no expectation of it making a major contribution before 1919. And it is precisely for that reason that Germany thinks it's worthwhile fighting the United States because it reckons that if it's still fighting the war in 1919, it will lose it. It's already fighting an economically superior alliance. The long-term prognosis is not good. It has to win the war by 1918. So that's the alliance picture. One alliance is beginning to unravel, and the entry of the United States forces the other alliance together in a way that it has never been forced together before. The Allies have, on the whole, been pretty good at organizing themselves economically to enable this war effort, but the United States' economic controls make that even more rigorous. Allied shipping is coordinating, allied purchasing is coordinating. If you're buying meat from Argentina to bring to France, which they are, you now are operating through a worldwide cartel which makes you a monopoly purchaser. You're very powerful in the market. But of course the way in which we remember this Allied coordination is in terms of creating a joint military command. Ferdinand Foch is appointed not actually commander-in-chief initially, but the coordinator of British and French operations in this sector as a response to the German offensive of the 21st of March 1918, about which I'll say something in a moment. The consequence of that is the coordination of operations on the Western Front. But the real pressure that ensures there must be Allied coordination is the arrival of the American Expeditionary Force. Because by the end of 1918, the American Expeditionary Force will be bigger than either the French or the British Army. And in June 1919, it will be bigger than both of them combined. It will be 4 million men to roughly 2 million men in each of the French and the British armies. When the Expeditionary Force arrives from the United States in 1919, the Allies will win this war. Their worry is will they lose it before they win it. Two reasons worry them. First, the Russian Revolution, a product, if you like, of the discontent of people who are exhausted by war that has gone on for so long, who've been deprived of food. That is not a phenomenon confined to Russia. It is common across Europe. When the Allies look at what's happened in Russia, both in France and in Britain, they say, that could happen to us. There have, of course, been mutinies in the French army in 1917. The Italian army collapsed at Caporetto in October 1917. There is a real worry about the morale both of the armies, which after all are citizen armies drawn from the whole of society, and those societies themselves. So the worry militarily is, will we lose the war at home before we win it at the battlefront? The other concern is that the German army, having finished its war in the east, will be able to concentrate its forces in the west. Germany brings over 30 divisions from Russia to the west in 1918. And between March 1918 and July 1918, it launches five major offensives. The first of them here on the Somme on the 21st of March 1918. And it is that, of course, that provides the immediate trigger for Foch's appointment as the Allied coordinator. That is followed by another one in April in Flanders, just south of Ypres, by a further one on the 27th of May in Champagne against the French army, although there are some British and American forces involved in that operation too. A further one in June that affects both the British and the French. Four offensives. The challenge now is how and when to respond to that pressure. For the first time in the war, the Western Front is now the major front. 
There's an old debate about Easterners versus Westerners, which is more important in Allied strategy. It's a futile debate. Each front depends on the other until 1918. But with Russia out of the war, the Allies have two effective fronts, the West and what we might call the Southern Front, Italy and the Balkans. With the United States entering the war, these guys are going to come in at Brest, Le Havre. The shortest route from New York is across the Atlantic. That was even true in 1914 of the British Expeditionary Force. The bulk of the British Army, once it became a mass army, could only be here in France and Belgium because it could not be supplied at greater distance than that. And so the Western Front has become the decisive front for the Allies and it's become the decisive front for Germany because it is one in Russia. Foch's job as Allied Generalissimo, in part, is to coordinate that response so it is focused here without neglecting the fact that there is still fighting going on in the Balkans and in the Ottoman Empire against Turkey. The pressure he's under as these German attacks come in, these four attacks between March and June 1918, is to counterattack. What he has to do is to prevent that happening. He says that's what we've done before. Every time the Germans have attacked, we have found ourselves counterattacking in isolation. They'll be able to deal with that. What we need to do is wait till the moment when we can counterattack with strategic effect and in a coordinated way. In April and in May and into June, he's getting flack from particularly Douglas Haig, but from other commanders as well who say, we want to counterattack now. And he's saying, no, wait. Haig fears that the attacks against the French, in particularly on the 27th of May 1918, are diversions, that the real focus of the attack has been against the British in March and April and will be so again. Foch resists all that pressure and by now he has the authority of being a commander-in-chief rather than just a coordinator. He has been able to put French troops into the battle in March and April, which have bailed the British out twice over. So he has a degree of authority across the Allied command. He holds back and then on the 15th of July 1918, the Germans launch their fifth offensive. It's against the French. The French know it's coming. They absorb the attack. And on the 18th of July, Foch counterattacks. The so-called Second Battle of the Marne, the first battle having been in 1914. Now is the moment when the Allies can go over to the offensives, which will run right through to November. Foch convened a meeting at his headquarters at Bonbon on the 24th of July 1918. It was the first time that all the Allied commanders had been together. Philippe Pétain, Commander-in-Chief of the French Army, Douglas Haig for the British, and John Pershing for the Americans. Foch said, we're going straight over to the attack. And he says, and I think probably exaggerates, that everyone was surprised and shocked. But crucially, there are a number of things that are now aligned in his favor. Number one, the Americans are beginning to arrive in force. And by November 1918, there will be two million of them. Number two, the Allies now have sufficient industrial superiority, sufficient artillery, that they can attack simultaneously and sequentially along the whole length of the Western Front, from Flanders down effectively to the Meuse Argonne, without having to shift artillery, without having to shift the resources to do so. And number three, they have a German army that has deprived itself of an effective coordinated response. What the German army has done has been to attack France in the West. The French army is still in many respects the dominant army on the Western Front. Even if it's losing strength, it's gaining an effectiveness under Pétain's leadership in 1918. They have failed to attack Britain where it hurts Britain most which is at sea. In 1918, a major military effort in the West on land by the German army is not accompanied by a naval attack. The crisis in the submarine campaign and the U-boat campaign waged by Germany has been passed. As far as the Allies are concerned, with the submarine warfare threat dealt with, they can continue the flow, particularly of American troops, to this country. It's worth remembering that American troops are being equipped and trained very largely by French and British forces. 
they're being given French tanks and French guns. The important point to realize is that in 1918, on the 8th of August, although it is a victory, nobody expects the war to end yet, except Douglas Haig, because Douglas Haig expected the war to end in every year from 1916 to 1918. He just happened to be right in 1918. Foch himself begins to realize that the momentum may be sustained and sets at that meeting at Bonbon, the 24th of July, a series of strategic objectives. This is not just about getting the next ridge. He says, as we attack, we need to clear the railway lines, clear the main railway junctions so we can maintain the momentum of our advance. We need to think about securing the resources of France that have been lost so we have the industrial underpinnings for continuing the war. We need to think of objectives that stack up, not just in terms of tactical and operational objectives, but objectives which stack up in terms of enabling us to sustain the momentum through to victory. That is essentially what happens here at Amiens. Why, once again, is there fighting in the Somme? Because there is one strategic objective here that the Allies have to defend. It is Amiens and the railway station, because that's the key logistic hub between Paris and Calais, northern France. That is threatened by the first German attack. The 8th of August attack releases the pressure on that. And when, at the end of that meeting at Bonbon, Haig metaphorically puts his hand in his back pocket and pulls out the plan that he and Rawlinson have been working on for an attack here at Amiens, Foch says, right, we can go for this. This can be the first major offensive following the French counterattack on the Marne. And moreover, you can have a French army under the command of General Debeney to accompany the Allied attack. So this is, as so much else is on the Western Front, in the end, a joint British-French attack with, of course, contributions not just from across the empire, but also from the United States. But nobody except possibly Douglas Haig, and maybe Foch, is thinking the war will end by the 11th of November, 1918. You have been listening to From Amiens to Armistice, a Chrome Radio production for UCL Institute of Education. The producer was Katrina Oliphant, with sound design by Chris Sharp. In our next podcast, we visit Murray Wood, the scene of a famous charge by the Canadian cavalry in March 1918 and fighting by the French 31st Corps at the Battle of Amiens in the August.